Hello, my name is Jasmine Johnson, and I will be presenting our work, Racial and Ethnic Inequities in Postpartum Pain Evaluation and Management. I have no potential conflicts of interest, but I do wanna disclose that this paper was published in the December 2019 issue of the Green Journal. So we are all familiar with the maternal mortality statistics in our country. But beyond maternal mortality, multiple studies have documented racial disparities in perinatal outcomes, including higher rates of perinatal morbidity and mortality among black birthing people and their infants. The persistence of these health disparities, independent of social determinants of health, suggests that in addition to societal racism, Institutional racism, which is defined as differential delivery of healthcare services by patient race, contributes to these disparate outcomes. Particularly when it comes to the treatment of pain among black and white patients, a number of studies have demonstrated bias and inequity. In emergency medicine data, white patients with migraines or back pain were reported to be more likely to receive opiate pain medication compared with Black patients with the same conditions. Among patients presenting to the emergency department with abdominal pain, white patients were more likely to receive any analgesia compared to both Black children and adults. In a New York obstetric population, Privately insured Black patients were found to have less epidural anesthesia administration than uninsured white patients who were also in labor. Although this study sheds light on the obstetric population, there is limited data on racial and ethnic pain inequities in the postpartum period. Which brings us to our study. We sought to determine the extent to which the frequency of pain assessments, pain scores, and medications administered differed by patient race and ethnicity after cesarean birth. We hypothesized that patients of color would undergo fewer pain assessments, they would report higher pain scores, and they would receive less pain medication than white patients after adjusting for clinical characteristics. We performed a retrospective cohort study. We included birthing people who underwent a cesarean delivery resulting in a live born infant at North Carolina Women's Hospital between July 1st, 2014 and June 30th, 2016. Patients were ex excluded for the following reasons. If they underwent a cesarean hysterectomy, if they had general anesthesia, patient controlled analgesia or infusion of IV opiates, if they had a history of chronic opioid use, which we indexed by methadone or buprenorphine administration during their birth hospitalization or dispensing of two or more prescriptions for opiates during their prenatal care, or if they had missing data for body mass index. Pain scores and medications administered after delivery were indexed to time since delivery. Our analysis was limited to two discrete time periods, 0 to 24 hours and 24 to 48 hours postpartum. Pain scores greater than 7 were categorized as severe pain, and opiate doses were converted to morphine medical equivalents and then opiate tablet equivalents so we could easily compare these things in the clinical setting. For context, at our hospital during the study period, there were standardized order sets for post cesarean birth pain management that included unscheduled as needed NSAIDs for moderate pain or a pain score greater than four and unscheduled as needed opiate analgesia for severe pain or a pain score greater than seven. These orders were placed by the obstetric provider and postpartum nursing staff performed these pain assessments on patients and administered analgesic medication when requested by the patient according to these order sets. Demographic and clinical information were obtained from the UNC Perinatal Database and the Carolina Data Warehouse for Health. Sociodemographic data were obtained, including self-reported race and ethnicity, age, marital status, 
insurance at delivery, primary language, and site of prenatal care. Race and ethnicity, as documented in the electronic medical record, were categorized into five groups, Asian, non-Hispanic Black, Hispanic, non-Hispanic White, and other. Clinical data obtained included body mass index, parity, history of prior cesarean birth, classical cesarean birth, gestational age at delivery, and whether one or more infant was admitted to the neonatal intensive care unit. To determine whether pain management varied by patient race or ethnicity, linear and logistic regression models were used. To test whether clinical factors confounded the associations between pain management and maternal race and ethnicity, we adjusted for propensity scores. P-values less than 0.05 were considered statistically significant, and all of our analysis were conducted using SAS. So now let's get to our results. During our study period, 1,981 patients gave birth, gave birth by cesarean delivery. 1,701 met inclusion criteria. Of those who were excluded, 18 patients underwent cesarean hysterectomy, 118 were administered general anesthesia, 68 required patient-controlled analgesia or infusion of IV opiates, 71 were chronic opiate users, and 50 were missing data on body mass index. 30,984 pain scores were recorded and 25,534 administrations of analgesic medication were documented. From zero to 48 hours after delivery, patients received a median of 18 pain assessments, a median of 13.2 opiate tablet equivalents, and a median of seven doses of NSAIDs. Sociodemographic characteristics differed by patient race and ethnicity. Compared to patients who self-identified as non-Hispanic Black, Hispanic, or other race or ethnicity, non-Hispanic White and Asian patients tended to be older. They were more likely to be married. They were more likely to be privately insured and were more likely to receive their prenatal care at our institution. Non-Hispanic Black and Hispanic patients were more likely to have a BMI greater than or equal to 30. And Asian and Hispanic patients were less likely to have a preterm infant or an infant in the NICU. Finally, with respect to demographic characteristics, it is important to note that 65% of Hispanic patients listed Spanish as their primary language. This is very important when we think about patient-centered care and equity and communication about and the treatment of pain. The following images come from figure one of our paper, pain and pain management from zero to 48 hours after cesarean birth by race and ethnicity. Non-Hispanic white patients, which are the reference group of, of our study, are represented by the blue color. Statistically significant differences will be noted in red. As hypothesized, the experience, assessment, and treatment of pain differed by race and ethnicity. Severe pain, which is a pain score greater than seven, was more common among Black and Hispanic patients than among patients who identified as white or Asian. This was seen at both zero to 24 hours postpartum and again at 24 to 48 hours postpartum. Compared with non-Hispanic white patients seen in blue here with an adjusted mean of 10.2 pain assessments, non-Hispanic black, Asian and Hispanic patients all seen in red here had fewer documented pain assessments with an adjusted mean range of 8.4 to 9.5 pain assessments at the zero to 24 hour postpartum time period. This was statistically significant. We also saw that again at 24 to 48 hours postpartum with non-Hispanic Black, Asian, and Hispanic patients with an adjusted mean of 7.8 to 8.1 pain assessments 
compared to non-Hispanic white patients with an adjusted mean of 9.2 pain assessments. We did not see a statistically significant different um, number of pain assessments for patients who identified as other. Compared with non-Hispanic white patients who received an adjusted mean of 8.3 opiate tablet equivalents, non-Hispanic black, Asian, Hispanic, and patients who identified as other all received less opiate pain medication at zero to 24 hours postpartum. This was again seen at 24 to 48 hours postpartum. Finally, at zero to 24 hours postpartum, non-Hispanic black patients also received fewer doses of NSAIDs compared to non-Hispanic white patients, as you can see here. At 24 to 48 hours postpartum, Asian and Hispanic patients received fewer doses of NSAIDs compared to non-Hispanic white patients. Given that the objective of our study was to determine whether pain scores or treatment differed by race and ethnicity, independent of clinical characteristics that might influence postoperative pain, we used multinomial regression to model the probability of belonging to each race or ethnic group as a function of factors that could influence pain, such as patient age, body mass index, gestational age at delivery, nulliparity, primary versus repeat cesarean delivery classical versus non-classical hysterotomy, and infant admission to the NICU. This table shows the propensity score probability of having a pain score of seven or greater compared to non-Hispanic white patients. As you can see in our adjusted analysis, during the two discrete periods, severe pain at any time was still more common among non-Hispanic black patients, which is highlighted here at zero to 24 hours postpartum, and again at 24 to 48 hours postpartum. We also saw that severe pain was more common for Hispanic patients in that 24 to 48 hours postpartum period. Our study should be interpreted in the context of its limitations. First, we analyzed our pain scores and medication administration that was documented in the medical record, which are subject to data entry errors. Secondly, we are unable to determine whether our findings clearly reflect differences in patient requests for staff assistance or differences in the staff attentiveness or responses to requests. Finally, we are unable to assess whether the presence of family support persons or other aspects of the clinical context might affect experience of pain and requests for or acceptance of pain medication. Our study strengths include the following. First, this is the first study to report on inequities in pain management after cesarean delivery. Secondly, it shows that discrete EMR data could be used to inform and track quality improvement efforts through identification of and subsequent initiatives to reduce health inequities. Finally, it reinforces the need for standardization of pain assessment and medication administration processes and the centering of implicit bias and or racism as a root cause of inequity. In conclusion, non-Hispanic Black and Hispanic post-cesarean patients reported statistically significant higher pain scores yet received fewer pain assessments and less pain medication. These differences were not explained by clinical factors associated with postoperative pain control, suggesting that differential treatment by race is contributing to inequities in postpartum care. These findings are consistent with and extend prior work documenting undertreatment of pain with pharmacologic methods among black patients. The same month that our study was published, Northwestern showed the same result. So we must be deliberate about calling out these inequities in order to truly uncover the why. One thought regarding the etiology of inequities in the treatment of pain is that these findings have a greater historical context and that false beliefs about biologic differences in pain tolerance between black and white patients that date back to slavery. 
The pervasiveness of these false beliefs were most apparent in a 2016 University of Virginia study that queried both lay people and medical residents on their present day beliefs regarding biologic differences between black and white people. Participants were asked to rate statements like, black people have thicker skin and therefore less sensitive to pain on their accuracy. They found that up to 75% of participants in the layperson group and up to 50% of participants in the medical trainee group endorsed at least one false belief about a black individual that could ultimately affect their clinical assessment of a black patient. So what's next? Well, health inequities are the symptom of a bigger problem. Black and brown people continuously have to prove their humanity in healthcare, in the criminal justice system, in education, and many other societal domains. We must continue to track race and ethnicity when we're looking at quality metrics. And finally, we must implement interventions such as implicit bias training and cultural humility related education to mitigate the effects of bias and racism in healthcare to ensure delivery of equitable care. I had the gift of, a, of um, attending the Racial Equity Institute groundwater training out of Greensboro. And they paint this beautiful analogy when it comes to health inequities and disparities and the disparities that we see in society. And they paint the picture. If you have a lake in front of your house and one fish is floating belly up dead, we ask what's wrong with that fish? But if you walk by and half the fish are dead, then we shift our thinking to what is wrong with the lake. Why don't we do this for people? Why haven't we looked at health disparities this way? Our study highlights an inequity in cesarean pain management, but I challenge you to think about each of these disparities and what you have been told is the why. This is going to take collective action. And on August 27th of 2020, ACOG released a joint statement on collective action addressing racism with other OBGYNs of specialties and societies. The Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine also has an equity page where they have this great infographic on strategies to overcome racism's impact on pregnancy outcomes. And here you can have some, not only some teaching on some of the biggest disparities in maternal and child health, but also some strategies to overcome them within your community. And finally, I leave you with the Alliance for Innovation on Maternal Health, which is a national data-driven maternal safety and quality improvement initiative based on proven implementation approaches to improving maternal safety and outcomes in, in our country. This is the AIM Health Disparities Bundle that's to be woven into how we deliver care to our patients. I get a lot of questions on where we can start, and I think this creates a great framework for adapting these practices within your own clinical setting. Tracking outcomes by race and ethnicity in your own unique clinical settings is a great place to start because you cannot fix what you don't measure. Thank you all so much for your time. I would like to thank the UNC Maternal Fetal Medicine Division, including my primary mentor on this project, Dr. Allison Stubbe, my co-fellows, our research staff, and grant support through the Health Resources and Services Administration of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Please do not hesitate to contact me with any questions, and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much.